The baseball trade deadline, which has uh, come and gone, and I had an unusual treat that I uh, filled in locally here in L.A. So I was on during the day leading up to the trade deadline and high drama on the transaction wire if you were not paying attention. Uh, we don't call it when, – when you do overnights, it's not moonlighting, it's daylighting. So I was daylighting. Uh, boy, those people who work during the day are bad people, man. But I was daylighting and uh, happened to be uh, doing stuff on the Dodger uh, station, counting down to the trade deadline, and there was a whole lot of nothing. There were people being traded that we had never heard of. We had to go to, like, baseballreference.com to find out who they were. This is a bad sign. And if you were not keeping track, the biggest name that was traded in the context of this season – it happened with three minutes to go before the deadline. Uh, three minutes. The uh, Doyers made a late play for a starting pitcher who will likely likely end up starting playoff games for the Dodgers, but they uh, made a trade for Jack Flaherty, who's from L.A., he's from the L.A. area, but Jack Flaherty, uh, that move coming down. The pike there from the Detroit Tigers. Uh, the Dodgers sent a couple of wishes in a bottle to Detroit. That's all they had to give up. Uh, a couple of those uh, minor league players. And Flaherty, 28, he had been bad up until this year. But at age 28, he had put it all together there for the Detroit baseball team and had an ERA of under three for the Tigers and a bunch of strikeouts and all kinds of good nerd numbers that people seem to like a lot. Like that, that a lot, those numbers. Uh, so let us discuss the question. We'll talk about other things as well. But the question, what is the Maller report card on the Jack Flaherty trade to the Doyers? Is that the biggest name that changed teams? So I, on this one, I've got cupcake, jewelry box, and diesel truck. We'll combine all of these things together. And uh, we are going to make the poopy waters of Paris is what we're going to make. Are they swimming in that right now? Is that where they are? Uh, the, the, the Olympics are? They are swimming in the poopy water right now. Oh, man, the E. coli is coming through the TV as we speak right now. All right. So, uh, A, my first thought on the Jack Flaherty trade to the Dodgers is the, the report card is it's not an A. I was going to give the Dodgers an A originally. My original thought was, hey, it's an A. All right. I'm giving it an A. But then, after a thorough minutes-long Maller investigation, uh, my final grade is B+. Uh, you probably didn't hear this, but I'll give you the play-by-play, the blow-by-blow. So I got into it with this guy named David Vasse, this guy that used to be relatable, but now he's, you know hangs out with all those rich Dodger players and all that. So he's lost his way a little bit. Uh, so uh, hanging out with him, right, and uh, talking to him about 30 minutes before the trade deadline. And he's giving me the talking points. And I know when I'm getting fed the talking points, uh, my my radar goes off and uh, my BS detector goes off. So he's trying to tell me that the the Dodgers acquiring Tommy Edmond from the Cardinals, who hasn't played at all, we talked about this in a previous episode of the show, and Michael Kopech, that these were going to be big additions for the Dodgers. So he tried to tell me. And he's like, well, these are perfect. It's what the Dodgers needed. A guy who's been a career failure on the mound, Michael Kopech, and a guy coming off uh, a wrist injury. Uh, so that triggered, of course, a conniption fit by yours truly. Uh, and uh, I've always thought when, when people tell me stuff and I know it's just bogus information, I was like, but don't – if I'm holding a cupcake, right? I got a cupcake and I'm holding it up. Don't spit a loogie on the cupcake and tell me you just put some frosting on the cupcake. There's no, there's no frosting there. You just spit a loogie. That's what we did. And so I was getting a loogie spit at my cupcake. Uh, I didn't like that. And uh, I was getting bamboozled by this. And then the, in the end, the Dodgers ended up doing what they have to do. Right? They're in. This is the Goldilocks zone for the Dodgers. I don't know how long it's going to last. Maybe it won't last that long. But every year they're a playoff team. Every year they're expected to go to the World Series. That's the way it is right now for the Dodgers. And it's something you have to do in that culture of baseball because you have to bring in reinforcements. You're expected – to bring in reinforcements because uh, that is a vote of confidence. If you don't trade for a, a name brand player, a player that's perceived to be great, it's a vote of no confidence from the front office. So the Dodgers did what the front office did what they had to do. They got the biggest name starting pitcher available. He's going to LA, not the Yankees, not the Phillies or the Red Sox. And the Yankees are getting killed for not trading for Jack Flaherty or someone 
who's the equivalent of Jack Flaherty. How do I know that? The Yankees have leaked to useful idiots in the media that Flaherty is damaged goods, and that's why they didn't trade for him. And uh, I was talking to Mike Harmon in the hallways here and Jason Smith. We were like, well, any pitcher in baseball. I could name any pitcher in baseball. I could say, that guy's going to get hurt. And you know what? I'm going to be right. Uh, they all get hurt. Every one of them gets hurt. The question is, does Jack Flaherty get hurt between now and the playoffs or the end of the playoffs, or does he get hurt next year or the year after? He's, at some point, he's going to get hurt. That's guaranteed. That's guaranteed. So I gave the Dodgers a B-plus on the trade because they they had to get a starting pitcher, uh, and they did that. The only real downside is whether or not this is a mirage, the way he is pitched in Michigan this year, he supposedly learned some new pitch. We'll see if that works on the West Coast. But he had an ERA of almost five last year, and he was traded, if I remember, from the Cardinals to the Orioles at the end of last year, and it didn't work out so well for him in Baltimore. Uh, Dodgers, to celebrate the fact that the front office went out and made a big trade, uh, they uh, Dodgers had a 5 nothing lead and then uh, jumped on the Vomit Comet in San Diego, and the pod squad uh, win. It's so great. Every time the Padres beat the Dodgers, it's like they won the World Series. It's got to be good for the for our friends in San Diego. Right? It's like the biggest thing in the world. You beat the Dodgers. Oh, my God. World Series time. All right. Padres made a bunch of trades also, which is one of those things, short-term gain for long-term pain because the chatter is they're, they're going for it this year because they're going to have to uh, cut away the dead wood, if you will, get rid of some of those big contracts in the offseason. So they're going all in now knowing that they're going to have to get rid of a bunch of those guys who they already have at the end of the year. Now, turning the page, uh, we talked about the Dodgers getting a B-plus. Now, what stood out post-mortem on the trade deadline? What stood out as the worst, most mind-boggling trade of the 2024 deadline? So that one is easy. All right, you, you open up the jewelry box, and the team that gets the Golden Fleece Award, the Houston Astros. How great is that? completely hornswoggled, completely hornswoggled. You hate to see it unless you don't. You hate to see it unless you don't. Uh, for some reason, the den of iniquity decided that they were going to trade for UC Kikuchi of the Blue Jays, a starting pitcher. Uh, Kikuchi has the worst ERA in baseball since late May. That's not my opinion. That is fact. It is on the record. You can look it up yourself. And so with this move, uh, Houston, I don't know if they traded anything at, at all uh, of value, but it's not about that. Supposedly they did. I, I don't know who these people are. I'm not going to sit here and pretend like some of these hack baseball scribes that they know who these minor league players are. What they usually do is they just go to the top 100 rating or whatever, say, well, you traded the number 22 prospect, and that seems like it's a mistake uh, and all that. But I am rejoicing in schadenfreude uh, that the a-holes made the worst trade. I love that. Uh, it's, it's so perfect. Uh, supposedly they gave up some blue chip scratcher tickets and all that uh, for an aging pitcher uh, who is going to be a free agent at the end of the year. Now, knowing the uh, the ass one one thousand two one thousand holes, the holes will likely end up teaching him how to like scuff the ball or something like that, or uh, they'll uh, come up with some cheat code. Uh, down the line. Now, last word, we quickly go to Chicago. I love the drama. It does not involve the trade deadline, although the White Sox made a number of trades, as the Cubs did. But the White Sox are currently on pace to finish with the worst record in the modern era. Now, the modern era, 162-game season. People talk about the worst team of all time. They often talk about there's a if you're an old-school nerd, you go back to the Cleveland Spiders back in the day. But for most people, it's the New York Mets, the Casey Stengel Mets, the worst team. But the White Sox are on pace to have the worst record. The current worst record for 162 games, I believe, is the Detroit Tigers, managed by Alan Trammell years ago. But that's not the story. The story here is we've learned now that the manager, Pedro Grafal of the White Sox, pointed this out in a team meeting after the All-Star break, trying to motivate the team. It's like a pep talk. Listen. You guys are on pace to be the biggest suck bag baseball team of all time. You'll always be remembered for that. You can change that by winning some games. I'm paraphrasing. Right? You can go out there and win some games, and then you you will not have this stain, this skid mark on your resume. So how did that go? Uh, well, how about a mutiny on the bounty? 
or in this case, a mutiny on the sinking ship. Uh, why are White Sox players supposedly grumbling? This has gotten out in the public theater. Why are White Sox players grumbling about a seemingly benign motivational attempt by the White Sox manager? So the obvious answer here is it hits close to home. I, I can't think of any other answer than that. It hits close to home. And all those White Sox players who have lived up to the hype, they were supposed to be bad, and they've been beyond expectations. Uh, and they're right now praying at the church of victimhood. Like, they're somehow the victim. How are you the victim? The manager doesn't play. You're out there actually playing. You're the one striking out. You're the ones blowing saves. You're the ones uh, having bad you know, bad at bats and all that. There's no accountability. Chronic complainers, the White Sox. And how dare you point out the truth? Who do you think you are? You can't tell us that. You might hurt us. We, we might need a therapy dog or something like that. My God, shame on you. Which the, the funniest part about this story out of the White Sox camp is it actually validates the manager. I don't know Pedro Griffo. I, I actually know somebody that knows him pretty well, thinks he's a good guy. But that's aside the point. I don't know him. And I couldn't tell you whether he could manage his way out of a wet paper bag. However, the, the fact that he's trying to motivate his team by saying, hey, if you, you, you play a little better, play a little harder, et cetera, you'll win a few games, you won't be the worst team of all time. And the reaction is that uh, these people are pushing back against that? Like you're driving the diesel truck. It's a Mr. Softy truck is what you're driving, the diesel truck. Mr. Softy, it's soft serve is what it is. 